Good morning, everyone. Before I call the men up, I'd just like to share a testimony with you. Last week I preached on staying plugged in with God. So Friday I lost my church keys. <laughs> and I couldn't find them anywhere, and I looked and looked and looked. So I continued on Saturday morning. I checked at work in my boss's truck, post office, everywhere you can think of. Finally, I'm in the, in the uh, yard at work, and I just threw my hands up in the air, and I said, God, without you, I can't do anything. I can't find nothing. I can't do nothing. I need your help. I'm plugging into you now. And I went home, and my wife says, would you please bring the garbage can in from the street? I said, okay. After all I went through today, you want me to do that? So I walked out there, and I picked up the, the chip back the can, and I moved it, and there's my church keys. God does answer prayer right away. Amen. Would all the men of God please come up front? Each other guess is voluntary. I ain't doing that. No. <laughs> We'd like to have the men come forward and step in the gap for this. This morning I'm going to ask Gene if he will do the prayer. Well, I want to thank all these men that came up here today. And I believe we got a pretty good room today. <laughs> and I, I just thank, uh, thank you that they come up here. And I want uh, everybody, all these men, to have whatever they got at home be for any, anything at all. Just work on it for them. If they need somebody to be healed, heal them. And we know that through your mercy you can do all that. And I thank you. God's prayer. Amen. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I walked in darkness and clouds covered me. I had no idea which way I would be. Then came the sunrise and pulled back the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light Just like a blind man, I wandered along Worries and fears I claim for my own then like a blind man, God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. When death takes me down and I breathe here no more An anthem of sound on that eternal shore I live with the angels in heaven on high Singing praise the Lord, He is the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Your turn, I saw.
now I am so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Hallelujah. I'm out of tune, so what's new? What do you want? In tune. <laughs> yep. B. It's your B string. Good for now? Yeah. For now. <laughs> for now. <laughs> okay. Patty, you can cut that part out. <laughs> Beautiful one, I hope. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one. My soul must sing Wonderful, so wonderful Is your unfailing love Your cross has spoken mercy over me No eye has seen, no ear has heard No heart could fully know how glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one, I hope. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must say. Beautiful one, I hope. Beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the sky. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing how marvelous how wonderful you are beautiful one i love beautiful one i adore beautiful one my soul loves You've opened my eyes to your wonders anew You've captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You've opened my eyes to your wonders anew You've captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one, I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul. Indeed, beautiful, is he not? Our gracious Heavenly Father, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. <laughs> Little discombobulated this morning. There we go. 
so true that we need Jesus all the time. Sometimes we don't even think about it till we really need him, amen? <laughs> I mean, it's too bad it has to be that way, but we're, we're creatures that have some limitations sometimes. But he's always there, and that's all that matters. He's always there. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest without you. I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you every hour, I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. You need him? Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Amen? Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Yes, where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness. Is Christ in me? Lord, I need you. Oh, sing it to Him. Every hour I need you. Yes, Lord, my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand out, all on you Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand out fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sing it again. Lord, I need you. I need you every hour I need you my one defense 
my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Oh God, how I need you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. in here oh God especially in this these times Lord we need you to help help us make sense of all the craziness that's going on as the people of God we need to draw nearer and nearer to him it's not just a saying, it's a reality. In 1841, Sarah Adams was stricken by the imagery you know, of Jacob's ladder and that whole thing in Genesis 28. And she couldn't help but find peace and solace in the idea of climbing closer and closer to her Heavenly Father. And so she wrote the following hymn which just kind of says it all. Nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee. And though it be a cross that raiseth me, Still all my song shall be Nearer, my God, to Thee Nearer, my God, to Thee Nearer to Thee Though like the sun gone down darkness be over me my rest a stone yet in my dreams I'd be nearer my God to My God to Thee, nearer to Thee. Then with my waking thoughts, bright with Thy praise, out of my stony griefs, Bethel, I'll raise so by my woes to be nearer my God to thee nearer my God to thee nearer to thee there And at rest There in my Savior's love Perfectly blessed Age after age to be Nearer my God My God to Thee, nearer to Thee, nearer to Thee. That should be.
be our heart's cry, to be near to him. Because he's faithful to his people, his promises are sure. He is not a man that he should lie, but he speaks truth, he speaks covenant. He speaks to his people. He said, my sheep, they recognize my voice. They will not follow the voice of another. Faithful one, so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord of all. I depend on you. I call out to you again and again. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up. When I fall down All through the storm Your love is The anchor My hope top faithful one so unchanging ageless one you're my rock of peace Lord I depend on you, I call out to you, again and again, I call out to you, again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love. our life. He is our God. What can more can be said about him? All that he's done for us, even when we're down. A lot of, we've got a lot of people that are sick and out, uh, but he is the great physician. We can go to him. We know that he hears us when we pray, and because that's true, we know that if we pray according to his will, 
we have whatever we ask for. And what he does, while he's conforming us to the image of his son, he shows us what his will is so that we might pray in agreement with him. Because his ways are so far above ours. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. King and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name Master Savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. King and kingdom will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Lord Jesus, we just have come to worship you, to bow down before you, to bring our petitions. But most of all, to bring glory you we glorify your name and we thank you Lord Jesus for the local church the thing that you created the thing that you love where your people come together and you are there in their midst we're just so thankful you're here Lord we ask that you'd have your way today that you guide each one of us as we have worshiped and as we fellowship Lord and and as we get into the word of God that you would continually speak to our hearts. We would be open to what you have to share with us today. And it's in your mighty name that this body cries out. It's the mighty name of Jesus. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Let's take some time to fellowship, break some bread or Oreos. What's today? Oh, praise the Lord, huh? Well, eventually we, we populated a little bit. I guess the 11 o'clock crowd came in. The bus must have shown up. All right. It's, it's the wine tour bus. The wine tour bus? 
<laughs> okay. All right, we're in Acts chapter 17. We are starting with verse 16 today. What we're going to look at is the preface uh, to Paul's Mars Hill speech, uh, his preaching, his proclamation, pick a term, any term. One of the most famous sermons, uh, speeches ever given, people have studied it over the years, but we're not going to get to that until the next time. What we're going to look at today is what leads up to that speech. What's going on in the Apostle Paul? Now, we know he's had to be running from uh, Berea because, you know, there was a whole group of uh, op opposition Jews who were, who were stalking him, and wherever he would go, they would try and turn the people against him. They didn't want him preaching this thing about Jesus, this carpenter who's saying he's the Messiah, to say he rose from the dead. So he was constantly having to deal with this opposition. So where we left off was they got him out of town. They got him out of Berea. His uh, Timothy and Silas and his crew said, you got to get going, and they sent him down to Athens, Greece. So we are living in a world gone mad. And it's exhausting, isn't it? You just watch the news, you get exhausted. About, Lord, what? 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 How can this happen? This can't be. No, people can't get away with that. Yeah, they do. And of course, as we know, today we can either be woke or provoked. Those that follow the gods of wokeness, they're overrunning our culture. Anything godly is canceled and true Christians are being shunned from the workplace, from the political arena, from the media. Obviously, the media is really bad with this. And, of course, higher education, which has been promoting this garbage for, for several generations now. And so now you've got kids that don't have a clue about how this country was founded and what it stands for. And so we find that exhausting. It just wears us out. And it causes us grief. A lot of us who are past the age of 50? You know, we may remember some things that young people today would just look at us with a blank look. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's the way it used to be. No, it couldn't have been. You, no way. You couldn't live like that. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, well, it worked for us. All right, all these things that liberals involved in, uh, this woke culture, it provokes believers because it should. But most are just impotently agitated. They're just agitated a little bit, not with a lot of power. They grumble a bit, they go back to allowing the neo-paganists to run the country. Even so, in the end, our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. It's not to the country, it's not to this political party, it's, not, it's to the kingdom. That's where our home is. We're strangers here. This truth should steer how we function as Christians within our culture. When you realize that the whole issue is the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is already determined to be so in heaven, which is how you translate that. We want God's will. And so when we see everything going on, we're just freaking out. God, you've got to be upset. If we're this provoked about it, God, you must be really ticked about what's going on. Well, as we look at Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 16, uh, we're going to see the key to understanding Paul's confrontation with the pagan culture of Athens. Paul's spirit was provoked within him when he saw Athens, the idol saturated city. Paul's monotheistic, born-again, sanctified, Christ-following spirit was so provoked, he took on the people of Athens in the synagogue, in the marketplace, and in the Areopagus, which is a uh, it's where all the laws were passed, and that's where the, the big-time stuff uh, of politics happened in Athens. 
Today, we're going to examine the preface, as I said, to Paul's Mars Hill speech. And next time we'll see what God was doing in Athens and why he did things this way, in this direction through Paul. So let's look at our text. It's Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that's Timothy and Silas, at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, the God-fearers, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And believe it or not, this was before social media. That spirit's been going on for a long time. Let's look at our first point. It's actually in verse 16. Paul is provoked by idolatry. There's a picture, a painting of Athens in its heyday. Glorious Athens, an amazing place. After a 200-mile trip from Berea to escape yet another mob that was stirred up by those Jewish stalkers I told you about, Paul waits in Athens for Silas and Timothy to join him. Glorious Athens was home to Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, and Zeno. Athens was the intellectual center of the world and home to scholars from all over the inhabited earth. It was like Oxford, England was in the last century, where everybody that was anybody in scholastics went to Oxford and argued back and forth and debated with the scholars there because they came there from all over the world. Cicero, the statesman, described Athens as singular upholding the reputation of Greece. And the poet Ovid called the city learned Athens. They thought quite highly of themselves, if you hadn't noticed. They figured they were the center of the earth. There's a bunch of intellectual, ivory tower, pointy-headed individuals. Athens was the birthplace of democracy. I don't know if you knew that. The principles of democratic government were introduced by Cleisthenes in 507 B.C. and from 460 to 430 B.C. Pericles developed democratic representation. Sound familiar? Much like our Congress, an assembly of 500 men, it would be 50 from each of the 10 tribes in Athens, they met 40 times a year on a hillside overlooking the Acropolis in Athens. And they decided foreign and domestic policy, democratic representation. They took votes. They listened to people. They did all that. Wouldn't it be nice if our Congress got back to that? Not some of the tomfoolery that they're dealing with now? Now, Rome had conquered Athens in 146 B.C., but because of Rome's love for everything Greek, they allowed Athens to retain its status as a free city. And we've looked at that in the past as we've been going through 
the book of Acts. And to be a free city, to be a city with a high rank in, in, in the Roman Empire was a big, big deal. I mean, it was very important, very prestigious, and that was Athens. Athens was the golden child, glorious to the eye, but empty and dead. She was living on past glory, for she was now overrun by idols. Let's look at that. As Paul waited for Silas and Timothy to arrive, he looked out over Athens, and he was spiritually provoked or greatly distressed, depending on what translation you're using. But he was provoked by the vast number of idols that were covering the city. Now in Greek, that word provoked is what we call a paroxysm. It's a sudden attack or a violent expression of a particular emotion or activity. For instance, one could experience a paroxysm of weeping. And if you've ever had that happen to you, you know what I'm talking about. It overwhelms you, and there's nothing you can do. That's how Paul was feeling. The Spirit of God within him was so provoked by this idolatry that Paul was experiencing an emotional upheaval by what he saw. The number of idols, and usually we're talking about statues, little types of statues, big, tall, medium. Inundating Athens, it's beyond imagination. Fifty years after Paul's visit, Pausanias said, it was easier to meet a god or a goddess on the main street of Athens than to meet a man. He said, what? That's an exaggeration. No, it's not. You see, the population of Athens at that time was about 10,000. However, there were 30,000 statues of gods. Now you're beginning to see what's going on here. Beginning to understand why God kept directing like a pinball, you know, boom, 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 directing Paul in this direction. They left Turkey, Asia Minor, and they got forced to cross the Aegean Sea, and now they're into Europe, they're into Greece, and, and they're up here in the northern part, but they keep getting forced down farther and farther south, and then they're finally in Athens. What is God up to? You know God has a plan, right? He doesn't flip a coin or willy-nilly or anything like that. He knows what he's doing. He wanted Paul there. Is it any wonder that the Spirit of God within Paul was provoked by this display of unrighteous human hubris? This is self-righteous pride off the charts. Now, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, the power of God unto salvation is what? It's the gospel. But God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You know, have you ever thought about the fact that a lot of the stuff that you're reading in the epistles, first of all, a lot of it had to do with stuff that was going on at that church. And he got wind of it, and so he writes a letter, in what we call scripture today, describing you know, how God wants the church to be run and what you're supposed to do with false teachers and these kind of things. But, and I forgot where I was going. Isn't that great? Getting old is fun. As we go to Romans chapter 1, <laughs> we're going to look at, oh, I know what I was going to tell you. A lot of the things that you read, for instance, Romans chapter 1, very famous chapter, right? About the wrath of God being poured out against all this sin in, in mankind, uh, exchanges the glory of God for the lie, and they begin to worship the, create, the creature rather than the creator. And you've been through Romans 1. You say, I wonder. A lot of that teaching in Romans might have been stimulated for what he saw in Athens. Something to think about. Because remember, he, as he writes the inspired Word of God, as God leads him by the Holy Spirit to write the Word of God, God is pulling everything that he has been experienced into the situation, into his writing. God's in control. 
He knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants in the scriptures eventually. He knows how to get it done. And he sends Paul, and Paul's going through these missionary journeys. You study all those in Sunday school. Paul's first missionary journey. Then Paul's second missionary journey. And then Paul's trip to Rome and, and all that kind of That wasn't willy-nilly. That was God directing his apostle. Saying, I've got a plan, and I need you here, and I need you here, and I need you here. And that's what he did. We are the beneficiaries. We have the word of God. It was for us that he did all that. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Wow. That first phrase in that first verse causes you to stop for a second. It's convicting. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And I have to immediately think, am I? If you're honest with yourself, you're thinking the same thing. It's almost a stab into the heart. Oh, Lord, I have been ashamed of the gospel. I have been afraid and timid and didn't want to share it. I did, but let's not stop there. I don't want to get you into a funk, get you all depressed. But wow, the Word of God, so powerful. It, it's like a spiritual scalpel, according to Hebrews. It gets in there and starts doing an operation. Dividing, dividing, dividing. Dividing between soul and spirit, you know, and body and soul, soul and spirit, and the thoughts, all the way down to the thoughts and intentions of our heart. So we read that first verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know what? That's what we're going to see. Is Paul begins to preach in Athens. You could tell that boy was not ashamed of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ and what God has done to rescue us from his coming wrath. That's the good news. I'm not ashamed of the, go of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Why? Why is this important? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. O oh, Athens, O oh, Athens, if you only knew what God had in store for you. I've got a song lyric going here. Wow. Because as we will see in our next message, the multitudinous amount of differing types of gods that were there, they were covering their bets. They were hedging their bets. They made sure they had every god that could ever be represented because they didn't want to leave them out and get, you know, ambushed by this God down the road. They even had, what? A monument, a statue to the unknown God, just to make sure nobody got left out. And here's Paul writing in the book of Romans. My gosh, the wrath of God poured out against unrighteousness. But they knew, they knew, behold the heavens, you know, God has made them. Everyone recognizes that. And the stars are His. And on and on it goes. We all know. But sometimes we're too smart by half. And we think we're smarter than God. When it really gets bad is we start teaching other people that. 
So, he says, after all that, they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. There you go, Athens, in lights, highlighted. Claiming to be what they thought they were the smartest city on the face of the earth. They were so smart, they could all just sit around every day talking about new things and listening to new things that are coming from somewhere else. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. See all those statues? All the Greek gods, the pantheon of the Greek gods? Their whole concept of gods was just oversized men having fits. Okay? They had elevated their concept of what they think a god should be. And it always looked like mortal man. Maybe with some wings. Whatever. But that's what it was. And, and I can just, you know, I was studying this this week, and I'm looking at that, and I'm going, was Paul writing this with the memories of Athens in the back of his mind? Mortal man, birds, animals, creeping things, you know, you got the whole gamut. But in the end, it's the worship of humanity, of man, that's the worst. Is it any wonder that the Spirit of God within Paul was provoked by Athenian idolatry? Paul is being stirred up emotionally by this Disney world of paganism. His spirit despises what he sees spread out before him. The word provoked is also used in Isaiah to reveal God's anger at idolatry. A people who provoke me to my face continually. That's God talking about the nations, the people groups of the earth who just constantly provoke him with their false gods and their worship of animals and this and that. He says continually sacrificing in gardens. That's a phrase talking about false worship, false gods. So we see, who was, was, was it really Paul that was provoked? Well, that's an interesting debate, isn't it? Because we know that dwelling within him is the very Spirit of God that saved him. Who was really provoked? God. God, thank you. But Paul, being submissive, submitted to his God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, he was experiencing that. And we do too. We understand those things. We see these things in our own lives. But this was a big one. This was powerful. As Christians, we're provoked by the, all, by the idolatry surrounding us. Our country's awash in false deities. The religion of the liberal left is socialism. I think you know that. Their sacrament is the blood of millions of aborted babies. Their God is the state. Because no higher authority can be allowed. They pump out their godless doctrines through politicians, the education system, and the media. Their demigods are Mother Earth, sexual perversion, and political correctness, to name but a few. So the question is, what provokes you? Maybe you're provoked by national politics. I know a lot of you are. You know, we all watch headlines and different things. We want to keep abreast of what's going on in the world, right? Sure we do. You might, I don't know how you do it, but I just kind of scan headlines every day and see what, what's really going on, and then if it's really something important, then I can go look at it. Every time you see, a pol see political players getting away with murder, are you provoked? I am. That angers me. Sense of fairness and justice and all those kind of things. Well, that's a natural reaction to evil and justice. Don't feel bad about that. You should be provoked. You know, this past week, we had an interesting thing happen. Maybe you're provoked by General Mark Miley's alleged treasonous actions while he was serving under the Trump administration. And so how could you not be provoked by the 
incredible hubris of General Miley and his political allies. They're excusing his actions as those of a real patriot. Well, there's a problem here because he crossed a bunch of lines to do this. His undermining actions against the sitting president are the definition of, number one, insubordination. Number two, violating the chain of command. And number three, the one everybody wants to kick around is possibly treason. I don't care about all that. But these are the things that provoke us when we see them. Well, maybe your righteous soul is provoked by Hollywood's attempt to normalize the perverse attitudes and actions of the sexual revolution. Do you groan within every time a commercial, a television show, or a movie shoves the gay lifestyle into your face? Ugh. Ugh. It's just constant. Are you provoked when your child or grandchild brings home school curricula advocating critical race theory and honoring BLM thugs? Well, you should be provoked by that stuff. It's insanity. Now, I put those out there just to give you a point of reference. Pull all these examples together and you may begin to understand how provoked Paul was as he observed Athens' preoccupation with idolatry. Athens was the microcosm of a sinful world in rebellion to its creator. It's all right there. As Christians, we must ask, why are we provoked? You've got to do a spiritual gut check every day, folks. You can't get carried away by every wind of doctrine or every fantastic thing you see on TV or on Facebook or on social media and all that kind of stuff. You need to go back in and check with God all the time, constantly doing a spiritual gut check. Why am I provoked? Is it the attack upon our politics, our patriotism, and way of life? that causes such provocation within us? If so, we don't understand what God is saying to us through Paul's experience here. Let's boil it down a little. Is it our flesh that is provoked? Or is it the Spirit of God dwelling within us that is provoked? Sometimes you need to ask the question. Am I provoked because the left is winning? or because the glory of God is under assault? Why am I provoked? Now, yes, God is angered by all the ungodliness spewing forth into our culture. Of course He is. He hates it. But all of that's just the result of sin, and it's nothing new. It's still awful, it's still terrible, and I don't want to demean it in any way. But we need to understand cause and effect. We need to understand what's going on. This is what sin does. It brings all of this stuff into our lives. The cause of such ungodliness is idolatry that has not been confronted by the gospel. Note Paul's response to the spiritual paroxysm taking place within him. What does he do? He counteracts with the gospel and not political strategies to ban idols in Athens. That should help you to kind of see a difference. He knew that the only response was the gospel. Now, you can work at the other stuff. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But you need to see the difference. You see, if the heart is not changed, idolatry remains. And God moves powerfully against idolatry. Our second point, the gospel provokes idolaters. So we see in verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. See, this resurrection thing, that was a 
<laughs> Believe it or not, that was a foreign concept to the Jews. Now, they believed in a resurrection at the end of time. But anything before that, that was weird to them. But you take it and move from there and get into the world, the Greeks thought, this guy's nuts. We got to hear some more. This is great entertainment. Let's get him down. Let's get, get the officials from the Areopagus to come and grab him and put him right in the middle, and we can all listen to this. Then we can make fun of him and stuff like that. Paul's counterattack against the sea of idolatry spread out before him was to preach the good news of the gospel. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring a bell anywhere? Maybe the Great Commission, something like that? The gospel states that all have sinned. None are righteous. And all are deserving of God's righteous wrath. However, the gospel... Part of it is that God has extended mercy and grace to those who call on the risen Lord Jesus to be their Savior and Lord. That's the gospel message. Apart from Christ, you're doomed. Can I tell you about Jesus and His love? What God wants to do, how He wants to pour out grace upon you. Would, would you hear what I have to say, brother? And we can see from Paul's strategy that though the audience can vary, and he, he'd been to many places, the gospel never changes. You know why? It doesn't have to. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, period. Let's look at Paul. Let's look at his M.O., his strategy. First, he went to the synagogues. He always did that. Whenever he went to a town that had enough people, Jewish people for a synagogue, he would go there first because that would make sense. They already had the Scriptures. They already had the Old Testament. They understood the language he was using. When he's saying Messiah, they go, oh, Messiah. But then he would have to define. But he already had them halfway down the road. He had to define, what does God mean by His Messiah? Because He's come. It's been fulfilled. And so you've got them halfway there with you. So that's, that's why He always started there. And then, of course, you know, there'd be, there'd be non-Jews there, God-fearers, who, who like the Jewish monotheistic lifestyle. And they just want to hang out in the synagogue. And so they were there, too. And they were trying to find out what God was all about. So He had a natural audience the gospel. That's why he would always go there first. But we see here in this whole Athenian situation that after, and you know you can only preach so long as we've seen in the synagogue and then the opposition starts coming up and you got people saying, don't listen to him, you know, he's teaching strange doctrines. Blah, blah. So then he would move out a little bit farther, circles would get bigger and bigger. Where does he go next? He goes to the marketplace. He goes to the mall, not this mall, a real one, okay, big one. That's what the marketplace is in those days. Why? Why would he go there? You got people everywhere. All you got to do is get your head on a pivot, and you're going to find someone to witness to. They're everywhere. Start talking. Start talking to this vendor and wait for the, the, the housewife that's looking for daily rations for her family. And she starts, starts wanting to listen. And so then he can slowly turn to her and say, hey, do you like what I'm saying? <laughs> Let me tell you some more. Let me share with you some more of what God has done. He's in the marketplace or what you would call street-level pagans. Common man. He, he could preach in the synagogue. Didn't matter. He could preach in the mall. Didn't matter. You know why? Because he loved people, and he wanted them to be saved. That's why. But as he's going about this, his teaching, as we just mentioned, you know, the word gets out, provoked the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers 
to enter the fray. They were hearing it. Of course, they just loved to argue for the sake of argument because they thought they were smarter than everybody else. And so they're jumping in. They're wanting to talk with him, and Paul's eating it up. He's loving it because there wasn't anybody smarter running around than Paul. That guy was a freak of nature <laughs> as far as knowing the Scriptures and, and, and following God and all that kind of thing. Now, the Epicureans and the Stoics, the two main philosophical schools of the time, what they believe, well, it's funny. When you finally look at all the different areas that they believed, it's the same stuff we're dealing with today. Nothing ever changes. Let's look at the Epicureans. These were the followers of da, 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 Epicurus. Made sense. They believe that everything happens by chance and that and then you die. I think there's a bumper sticker like that, something I can't repeat. And then you die with no hope of an afterlife. You live, life's tough, and you die. So long, sucker. Well, that's a that's a philosophy to live by. They were practical secular agnostics. That should be a they. They believed. There were gods, but the gods had nothing to do with the world. So, I mean, you know, they're open-minded. Sure, there's all these gods, there are gods everywhere, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. They don't affect our lives. They don't even care about our lives. Therefore, wisdom, true wisdom, is to be found in living simply and just seek as much pleasure as you can in this life. Well, that would make sense if you didn't think there was any afterlife if you thought you were going to die and become worm food, you should be looking for as much pleasure as you can in this life. What did Jesus say about that? If you seek to save this life, you're going to lose it. Totally 180 degrees wrong. Their view of life centered around the philosophy that there's nothing to fear in God. Whoa. To fear God's the beginning of wisdom. Again, they're 180 degrees out of phase. There's nothing to fear in death. Oh, if you only knew. Good or pleasure can be obtained, and evil or pain can be endured. Too bad for you. What about the Stoics? The Stoics followed the teaching of Zeno, and Zeno and Epicurus lived around the same time. If you look at the dates, you'll see that. Their name, the Stoics, is derived from the Stoa. And there's a picture of a Stoa. It's the covered walkway. We would call it in Scripture Solomon's portico. It's a big covered area where you could teach. You could have groups. You could have 100 groups in a diff all the way down because it's all covered. You're out of the sun. You're out of the rain. It's a nice place to sit and listen to teachers. Jesus taught under these porches often. One could say that Stoicism is the philosophy of the porch. But, you know, I was thinking about that, and that really should be reserved for Andy of Mayberry or maybe the Waltons. That's where the philosophy of the porch really comes in handy. The Stoics were pantheists, believing that everything is God, and they were just slaves to destiny. Consequently, they sought to live with apathy, fun, and detachment or fatalistic resignation. And even so, they argued for the unity of humanity and kingship with the divine. They valued reason, the world state, there's your globalist folks, and the cosmopolis, the community of the great city. They also preached self-sufficiency and obedience. So, that's what Paul is entering into is he's out witnessing first in the synagogues, then to street level pagan, pagans in the marketplace, in the mall. And then, of course, that brought out of the woodwork the, the big guns, the Epicureans and the Stoics who wanted to challenge this freak, this weird dude who had come in from somewhere else and they didn't like what he was saying, so they went after him. The Epicureans and the Stoics represented the popular pagan alternatives for understanding sinful humanity opposed to God's revelation. 
Nobody wants to hear about God's wrath. Nobody wants to hear about sin. Nobody wants to hear about, oh man, you know, I'm doomed unless, you know, I go to this God and humble myself. People don't like that. We're a prideful, prideful creation. And groups don't want to do that. People don't want to do that. They don't want to admit that they, they, Jesus is Lord. The bottom line to all intellectual philosophies is that apart from Christ, there is no hope for this life or the life to come. So how did these egotistical blowhards respond to the gospel that Paul preached? Well, they called him a babbler. If you're wondering about the title of this message, here it is. They called him a babbler. The word in the Greek is literary seed picker. Now, originally, it described birds picking up seeds, hence the sparrow. However, it eventually came to mean one who peddled others' ideas as original without understanding them. In other words, a plagiarist. Or a chirping gutter sparrow voicing borrowed ideas but has no idea what they mean. Joe Biden is a confirmed serial plagiarist. That's not an opinion. And I don't mean it to be mean. That's a fact. You can look it up. That's why his other runs for the presidency didn't work. Because back then, people didn't like plagiarists. Apparently, now it's okay. But a plagiarist is a seed picker. The current question circling Washington, D.C. is this. Who's actually making policy? You may have heard that already. Well, it's not President Biden, and it's not Vice President Harris. It's somebody else, some group, something. After all, Biden's a corrupt politician with cognitive, moral, and ethical challenges. That's just a matter of record. I'm trying not to be mean. But it's a fact. And the other is an opportunistic politician who was used to harvest the liberal black and female vote. That's what you're dealing with. Seed pickers who are voicing opinions about things that they know nothing about, and they're actually carrying the water for somebody behind the scenes. This whole Marxist march, this socialist march that we're dealing with in the last years, it's been going on for a while, but we've really seen it. That's what's going on. And the seed pickers are those that pick up on it and talk about it, and voice how everything, you know, critical race theory, this, that, and the other. That's, all, that's where all it comes from. The puppets, and that's what we've got in the White House, puppets of a cabal of power brokers pulling strings behind the scene. They chirp borrowed ideas from socialist icons. It's a circus of seed-picking babblers. These U.S. government gutter sparrows are present-day Athenians who view the scriptures the way the Athenians viewed Paul's gospel. And that's why I brought this up, not to get political, but you need to see there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same old stuff going on. We're facing the same opposition that Paul faced. There's nothing new, as I said, under the sun when it comes to opposition to the gospel. Paul's evangelistic strategy was perfect. He witnessed to the religious, that would be the synagogue. He witnessed to the common man, that was the marketplace. And he witnessed to the pseudo-intellectuals of his day. One thing that he discovered, as we have also, is that not everyone answers the gospel call. You can go out and witness, which you should, in, in every manner or form that God gives you. But you need to know not everybody's going to listen to your message. I think you've found that out already, right? Okay. However, that cannot stop us from advancing the gospel. We are not responsible for a person's decision. That's up to God. Yet we are held responsible to preach the gospel in season and out. 
And if we are faithful to preach the gospel to all who God places in our path, we will experience him opening doors for us to witness of his love, mercy, and grace on a grander scale. And that's what we're going to see. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. The doors have been swung wide open. They act, the Athenians actually, the power brokers, went down and grabbed him in the marketplace and brought him to the highest. It'd be like putting you in the Colosseum to be able to preach a message. They want him in front of the power brokers, of the, of the people that make decisions. We want to hear from you. What is it you're babbling about? What is it you're saying? We, we want to pass judgment. God opened that door. Why? Because he was faithful. He went through the synagogue. He went into the marketplace, always doing what? Witnessing of the kingdom of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God just kept opening doors, bigger doors and bigger doors and bigger doors. Paul preached and the gospel was doing what he was intended to do. This combination of a new teaching and the unknown concept of physical resurrection intrigued the intelligentsia in Athens. They brought Paul to the Areopagus, which we know is Mars Hill. This was where new ideas were proclaimed and defended. It also served as a place of trial and judgment. This was the big leagues. And who got him there? Well, God did. But he was faithful to answer the gospel call, to preach it and let God decide what was going to happen. God had opened the door. Now, it's obvious that Paul is preaching about some unknown deity with divine powers, and the Athenians desire to hear more. They're especially skeptical about this whole physical resurrection thing, and I mentioned that earlier. But it's at this point. Now, this is the kind of stuff you have to dig up, because you don't notice it when you're reading it. It's something you have to go into a little bit deeper. This verse here about, oh, they spend all of their time just looking for new, talking about new things. That's Luke being funny. That's a dig at these folks. He decides to have a little fun with the arrogant Athenians and their foreign colleagues, people that came in from all around the globe to be a part of the Athenian culture. Luke sees these presumptuous prigs as philosophy gossips. Therefore, by stating that they waste their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new, he turns it all around. He brands them as the actual seed pickers that they accused Paul of being. They're the seed pickers. They're the ones voicing stuff they don't even understand. They're talking about stuff they have no concept of. Whoa. You want Luke on your side especially if he's writing for the newspaper. These Greeks are clearly the Greek version of social media warriors, constantly involved in conspiracies and talking about this and that and the other. But what has happened here is that the scene is set for Paul's Mars Hall speech. We will examine the contents of Paul's gospel proclamation in the next message. We will see what happened after this lead up and why. So we ask ourselves two questions as we conclude. Are our spirits provoked by the idolatry that surrounds us? People are lost and heading into a Christless eternity. This includes those who consider themselves too wise to believe in God. You know anybody like that? Witness to them about the gospel and say, oh, come on. If, if that's what you need, get through, fine. But I'm not believing in some mythical figure that you throw up your wishes to and hopefully one of them sticks. You've been running to those folks, just too smart for God. 
And then there's the other side of that. Those are just totally helpless, broken, and they don't know what to do. J.R. Vassar was a missionary. He was writing about something that happened in Myanmar, which we used to call Burma. He says, one day we were prayer walking through a large Buddhist temple when I witnessed something heartbreaking. A large number of people, very poor and desperate, were bowing down to a large golden Buddha. They were stuffing what seemed to be the last of their money into the treasury box and kneeling in prayer, hoping to secure a blessing from the Buddha. Now, on the other side of the large golden idol, scaffolding had been built. The Buddha had begun to deteriorate, and a group of workers was diligently repairing the broken Buddha. I took in the scene, and here's what he understood. Broken people were bowing down to a broken Buddha, asking the broken Buddha to fix their broken lives while someone else fixed the broken Buddha. People need the gospel because they're in bad shape all over the earth. Second question, are we provoked enough to preach the gospel to whomever God places in our path? Like Paul, we can proclaim the gospel within a never-widening circle. First, we can witness within our comfort zone. That was the, the synagogue for him. Then we can witness to those intersecting our paths on a daily basis. You know, at the mall, at the grocery store, at work, at, you, over the fence with your neighbor. And lastly, God may call us to witness to a specific group with whom we are familiar. Maybe you were trained in a certain study, in a certain discipline, he might send you to others who have been trained that way because you speak the language. And he can use you to do that. That's what he did with Paul. When he sent him into the synagogue, they all understood the language. There was no barrier there. They understood the Old Testament. They understood the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes he can do that. But in the end, our calling is to go into all the world preaching the gospel. It's not optional. Most Christians see that as an option. It's not. You say, well, I'm too old now. I'm too crippled up. I got, I'm on medications. I'm just talking about me right now. You know, I, <laughs> I can't go there, so don't even think I was talking about you. I can't do that now. You know, it's just a little too difficult. Fine, fine, fine. But do you think God doesn't know all that? You don't think he can weed through those excuses? He may just call you to the swap meet. You're now a missionary to the swap meet. You didn't even have to move out of your house. You didn't have to fly halfway across the world. See, God's got this thing under control. He's just looking for a people who will believe him and go. Go into the whole world preaching, telling them everything, teaching them everything I taught you, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go. George Ladd, a former theologian, passed away, uh, said this, God alone, God alone, who has told us that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations, God alone will know when that objective has been accomplished. But I do not need to know. I know only one thing. Christ has not yet returned, therefore the task is not yet done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility is not to insist on defining the terms of our task, our responsibility is to complete it. So long as Christ does not return, our work is not done. Let us get busy and complete our mission. Father, we thank you for what we see in this passage in Acts chapter 17. It is so convicting. It is so powerful. 
It is so informative, and we just want to praise you for it. We want to give you thanks that you have supplied your word to us. Oh, Father, just as we read it, as we look at it, we, we just feel your spirit saturating us with your truth. Lord, help us to, to walk in your ways. We want to be a people that are always ready to go with the gospel to whomever you've called us to present it. And we know, Father, it's your gospel. And we know that the decisions are yours. We don't need to feel guilty if someone doesn't believe that's your business. Our business is just to be obedient and go. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.